We've looked at solvents, and now we need to look at the behavior of ions in solution. So remember, we just find a few basic terms with that, terms of our ions, our cations, cathode, anions, anode. But fundamentally, ions are what give solutions their conductivity. So whenever we think of a current flowing in a solution, we have to visualize it as a flow of ions, not as a flow of electrons. Whenever we make conductivity measurements, these can all be traced back to ionic interactions, to how these ions behave in solution. The ionic mobility that we discussed is a phenomenon which links the measurable quantities to do with the, qu the currents that we observe in solution, as well as the theoretical quantities in terms of the limiting con conductivity of an ion. We'll first introduce some basic concepts to cover mobility in solutions. The first of these is diffusion. Diffusion is simply motion due to concentration differences. So if we have a concentration of ions in one part of the solution, we would expect these to diffuse through the solution so that we get an even concentration throughout. This applies to all molecules in that solution. Migration, by comparison, is motion due to electric fields. So if we put an electric field across our solvent, we would expect our ions to move in the direction of that electric field relevant to their charge. It only applies to charged particles in solution, so these ions that we're talking about. The third motion of mobility is something called convection, which is motion due to thermal phenomena or simply stirring the solution. It's not considered in this course, but it's something to be aware of, as it's something that you are probably already familiar with. In order to make measurements on electrochemical cells, we need to establish some basic electrical concepts. So this will require a little bit of physics revision, but is vital to understand. The first of these is current. Current is simply the flow of charge and how it moves around a circuit. So the current can be delivered a number of different ways, but fundamentally it is a transfer of charge. Voltage is another one, but we would tend to talk about it in terms of a potential difference, and we'll talk about that later in the course. But a voltage is something that can be very easily measured using a voltmeter. The next phenomenon to consider is resistance, which carries the unit of ohms. Resistance is simply the resistance to carrying electrical charge. The greater the resistance, the greater the potential difference required to push a current through that conductor. Power is another phenomenon that we need to discuss. Power is simply the rate of transfer of energy. So in electrical terms, it's a relationship between the current and the voltage. The last one, which is slightly different, is conductance, G, which is simply the inverse of the resistance. So the greater the conductance, the lower the resistance. And these are all kind of fairly, kind of, we're fairly comfortable with these as ideas. But it's important just to lay down which ones we're going to be using. When we think of electrochemistry, we think of solution conductivity. So we tend not to think about what's going on in the external circuit. We only think about what's going on in solution between our two electrodes. This is, as we said a couple of times before, is the result of the mobility of charges. It's not a straightforward process. So we need to be aware of what it is we need to consider. And at this point, it's worth flagging up that conductivity is different to conductance. So I mentioned conductance on the previous slide. I mentioned them both to avoid confusion. Conductivity is simply the ability for a solution to carry a current through motion of ions, whereas conductance is simply the ability to pass current. So conductance applies to anything which carries electricity, but conductivity is specific to the solution. And it's conductivity that we're going to be looking at in this course. Measuring conductivity is slightly tricky, but it's a fairly straightforward procedure once we see what's going on. To do it, we need to take two equally sized electrodes. So we have our cathode of a given area, and we have an anode of equal area. We make sure that these are parallel, and we separate them by a fixed distance. We can then apply a potential difference across them and measure the current that goes through the solution. This allows us to determine the resistance so via this V equals IR relationship. So we just rearrange this, divide both sides by I, and we get a value for the resistance. This gives us a value for that solution conductivity, which carries a symbol kappa, which is Greek letter K, and it has a unit of per ohm per meter. And we simply use this equation to determine our solution conductivity. A solution conductivity is measured, but it only relates to that particular solution that we've measured at the time. A more useful measurement is the molar conductivity, so looking at how the conductivity of a solution varies with its concentration. This is known as the molar conductivity and carries this symbol lambda. So this is a capital lambda with subscript M for molar conductivity. And this eliminates the effect of concentration. So this will give us the molar conductivity for any solution of a particular analyte that we're interested in. Now the units of the molar conductivity can be complex. So kappa is in per ohm per meter, the concentration C, is in moles per cubic meter. We're trying to keep an SI units, remember. We're normally used to DM per dm cubed. Here we're interested in meter cubed. 
while the limiting molar conductivity is in ohms per square meter per ohm square meter per mole. These units can be complex, but it's important you're able to move between them. When we look at the actual formula itself, when we see these units written down, we normally see them in the square centimeter unit. So it's important that you're happy with this particular conversion because the conversion is absolutely vital. Remember, we're stressing how to convert units all the way through your course. So make sure you're happy with this unit conversion. When we think of conductivity, we want to look at the concentration. So concentration, as I'm sure is no surprise, greatly affects the conductivity of a solution. And the common way of thinking about it is that higher concentration gives higher conductivity because the reasoning is that we have more ions in solution, so there are more current carriers. This seems a perfectly logical way to think. However, as is always the case, it's never quite as simple. And when we measure our conductivity, we find that actually as the concentration increases, we get a decrease in the molar conductivity. So it does vary with concentration, but in the opposite way that we would predict. So this seems extremely strange. So we need to un unravel why that's the case. We also see here, we've got two electrolytes. We've got a strong electrolyte, potassium chloride, and we've got a weak electrolyte of ethanoic acid. So we need to unravel this a little bit because again, not only does it depend on concentration, but it also depends on the type of electrolyte. Although in this case, the fact that the weak electrolyte has a lower conductivity should probably doesn't surprise us because we would expect fewer current carriers. But this is in contravention with what we see at increasing concentrations. So let's start looking at these phenomena. The electrolyte itself is extremely important. So when we think of strong electrolytes, we assume them to be 100% dissociated into ions. So HCl, KCl, and so on and so forth. We have 100% dissociation, so we would expect there to be a commensurate effect on the conductivity. But the degree of dissociation depends on the solvent. We almost always consider water, but what happens if we deal with a completely nonpolar solvent, if we consider something like dry HCl in benzene? So this is a very, very weak electrolyte, and HCl will tend to clump together as ion pairs. Ion pairs have a net charge of zero, and when we apply a potential difference across this, no current flows. So we need to consider what's going on there. We saw that the conductivity decreases with concentrations. So to understand that, we need to look into these ion-ion interactions and ion-solvent interactions. The more the ions interact with themselves, the less current will flow, but the more it interacts with the solvent, we'll get more of an effect on the conductivity. So at these very low concentrations, we see we have an increase in the conductivity, which seems completely counterintuitive. Counter at this point, we're going to introduce the phenomenon of infinite dilution. This seems like a very strange one to think of, but it's a way of unifying molar conductivity and allows us to study it in more detail. The method was come up by Friedrich Kohlrausch, who proposed our limiting molar conductivity at zero. This is simply an extrapolation to zero concentration. What is our conductivity at zero concentration? So at zero concentration, we have no ion-ion interactions. Almost by definition, then, our molar conductivity is highest at infinite dilution because there are no ion-ion interactions to slow down the migration. The limiting molar conductivity is simply defined as the sum of the limiting molar conductivities of each of the ions, so the, the positive ion and the negative ion. So let's unravel this a little bit because it seems a bit odd. How can we measure a conductivity at effectively zero concentration? So let's explore this a bit. Firstly, let's consider the ionic atmosphere. Remember that we said this was the surrounding atmosphere of ions around a central charge. It's spherical and symmetric in the absence of an electric field. Now, I'm not going to put all the other counter ions in here, but assume they're, they're present. As soon as we apply an electric field, so as soon as this goes into an electric field between two electrodes, this ionic atmosphere starts to be distorted. So think about the shape, the overall shape of it. Remember, the ionic atmosphere will have an opposite charge to the central ion, which means it's attracted to the other electrode. This causes drag on the ion. It slows the ion's migration down. This is something known as the relaxation or the asymmetric effect. But when we get to low concentrations, remember that ionic atmosphere increases in size and becomes more diffuse. So the more diffuse it is, the less drag it causes. So at lower concentrations, we get less drag, we get less of an effect on the mobility of the ion, which increases the molar conductivity. The next thing we're going to look at is the solvent. So remember solvation shells. So around a central ion, the solvent will organize itself and be tied into a solvation shell. So whenever an ion in solution is solvated and it migrates, it's going to be carrying the solvent molecules with it, which gives it more mass, which it also increases the drag in solution. So as it migrates towards the opposite charged electrode, 
it's dragged more, it's held back more by the solvent in solution. This is something called the electrophoretic effect and is informally termed solvent drag. At lower concentrations, we get less drag. Well, why is this? Well, if we think about lots of these solvated ions moving together, they have to push past each other, they have to jiggle past each other. But at lower concentrations, there is more free solvent, which means there is more space between the ions, and it's easier for those solvation shells to slip past each other. The next thing we're looking at is the effect of ion pairing. So remember that direct ion-ion pairs occur when we don't get solvation. So if we imagine this ion-ion pair forming here, but we also have some ions free in solution as well. The ion pair carries no charge, so when we put it into an electric field, counter, free counter ions move, but the ion pair stays locked together. When we have low concentrations, we get less pairing happening, so there are proportionally fewer uncharged ion pairs. Consequently, if we have fewer ion pairs, the net mobility of ions in solution increases as well. So we have all of these different effects happening. We have the ionic atmosphere, becomes more diffuse at low concentrations, increasing mobility. The solvent solvation shells interact less with each other, so there's increased mobility at low concentrations. And we get less ion pairing at low concentration, which increases the mobility of the ions. So all of these effects serve to increase the mobility, which increases the molar conductivity. When we think about weak electrolytes, they are different to strong electrolytes, but electrochemically, it's important to consider what they're doing as well. So let's consider our acetic acid dissociation. So we have acetic acid plus water dissociates into the hydroxonium ion and the acetate ion. These have lower conductivity than strong electrolytes. This shouldn't be a surprise to us. There are fewer charge carriers due to lower dissociation uh, and consequently we can ignore the ion-ion interactions. But as the concentration drops, the dissociation constant remains a constant at a given temperature, but the proportion of the acid dissociated changes. This may seem slightly odd, but if we look at this particular equation here, we're looking at the only thing we're interested in, the concentration of water, we're going to assume is constant, we'll eliminate that. We have our dissociation constant, but it takes the form of x squared over y. So we've got two values that are squared. Remember the hydroxonium ion and the acetate ion are in equal concentration, so x squared divided by the concentration of our acetic acid. What happens as each thing varies? Well, let's rearrange this equation. Let's make the concentration of the acetic acid the subject. So this varies with x squared. If we increase the stock concentration by 4, this means the hydroxonium ion, the thing we're interested in, one of the charge carriers, only increases by 2. Whereas, let's go the other way, if we decrease the concentration of this by 100, the concentration of the charge carriers only decreases by 10. So because of this, we get this greater and greater dissociation at, in, at lower and lower dilutions to a point where at infinite dilution we have 100% dissociation. We get the same behaviour as for strong electrolytes. However, measuring the conductivity of weak electrolytes becomes a challenge. In order to overcome this, we need to consider the law of independent migration. This describes how ions behave, and its core assumption is that electrolyte behaviour at infinite dilution is identical. So remember that we had these definitions for the sums of it for infinite dilution. So at infinite dilution, we would have, for HCl, we would say that the overall molar conductivity at infinite dilution is equal to the sum of each of the molar conductivities of each of the con constituent ions. So that seems fairly straightforward. That's absolutely fine. We're okay with that. But the thing to remember with the independent migration is that whatever we're working, the conductivity of the proton is the same regardless of where it comes from, regardless of whether it comes from HCl, sulfuric acid, whether it comes from ethanoic acid, or whether it even comes from water itself. This allows us to determine the limiting molar conductivity for any weak electrolyte. We can't measure it directly because we can't measure a limiting conductivity. We have to predict it based on the observations we make. But because this isn't fully dissociated, because the ethanoic acid isn't fully dissociated, we can't measure it directly. So we need to work around a little bit. But we use this idea that the molar, limiting molar conductivity for any ion is the same regardless of where it comes from. All we need to do to calculate the limiting molar conductivity for acetic acid is just to find strong electrolytes that provide the data we need. As it happens, there's a complete set we can use. We can use the limiting molar conductivity of hydrochloric acid. This will give us our limiting molar conductivity of the proton, which is what we need. And we can use the limiting molar conductivity of sodium acetate 
this is a strong electrolyte, remember it's 100% dissociated, this will give us the limiting molar conductivity of the ethanoate ion. And then we can simply just substitute use these into the original equation to get our final expression. You've used a method very similar to this whenever you were doing Hess cycles for solving simultaneous equations in maths and so on. Simply we're looking for the terms that we can substitute into our equation. Remember we can treat chemical equations just like a mathematical one. So let's do this. It's fairly straightforward to get the proton. So if we look at this is the equation we're interested in, we want to find the limiting molar conductivity of ethanoic acid. So let's look at our proton first. Fairly straightforward. If we consider hydrochloric acid, it's the limiting molar conductivity of hydrochloric acid is simply the sum of the proton and the chloride. Let's rearrange, let's subtract the chloride from both sides and we get an expression here which is simply the molar conductivity of the proton. We can just take this and replace the proton conductivity in the original equation, which gives us this expression here. So we've got the limiting molar conductivity of ethanoic acid expressed in terms of a strong electrolyte, which we can determine fairly easily. And then we've got two ions, which we need to consider now. So let's go back to our next electrolyte. It's harder to spot the ethanoate anion conductivity, but remember that the sodium ethanoate is a strong electrolyte as well. So it is 100% dissociated. Therefore, we do the same thing. We set up the equation where we have the limiting molar conductivity of sodium ion and the ethanoate ion. Rearrange, then we've got a value that we can simply take this and plug it in for our ethanoate ion here. And this gives us yet another strong electrolyte that we can use to work backwards to calculate the limiting molar conductivity of ethanoic acid. The last one we need to unify is the chloride and the sodium. Well, this seems fairly straightforward again. Sodium chloride, provides the data we need. However, it's worth noting that these are negative signs that we need to consider. But we already know how to handle this in terms of the mathematics. We simply subtract the expression for the limiting molar conductivity of sodium chloride, put it into our equation, and remember that we've got a reversed sign. Fundamentally, what we've shown here is that we can express any limiting molar conductivity as a sum of other limiting molar conductivities. We cannot measure directly the limiting molar conductivity of a weak electrolyte. But we can always find it in terms of strong electrolytes. We can always find a strong electrolyte containing the ions that we need and do the appropriate measurements. So we can look at any limiting molar conductivity. However, it is much easier to determine the limiting conductivity for a strong electrolyte. We can take measure the data directly and abstract to find the values. In summary for this session, ions move by the diffusion, migration, and convection through solution. The only two we're interested in is diffusion and migration. Convection, we leave for later. The solution conductivity is affected by concentration and the strength of the electrolyte, but not in the way we'd predict. At higher concentrations, we see a reduction in the conductivity due to the effect of the solvation and the ionic atmosphere. And we remember that we, while we can determine limiting molar conductivities for strong electrolytes, we can't directly measure the conductivity of weak electrolytes. So we need to use this idea of independent migration of ions.